Amen. I love the Lord. Amen. And I love what I feel in this place today. And uh, I love coming to church when you can feel God. I don't know about you. I love coming to church and you can feel the presence of God. Amen. I um, give honor to my pastor, my bishop, and uh, Sister Foster, give honor to you. The rapture has taken place. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Y'all just tell her I honored her. I want credit. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to speak to us this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to take a few moments and... Um, and I want to talk to us about a topic that, uh, that for many of us, if I was to say the word, I'm going to say the title first, um, but if I was to give you this word, many of us would immediately think, probably most of us would think negative, um, because this word has really been misused in certain places. It's been misused um, even in our personal lives, and people that we know have misused this word. And um, if you're a parent in this house, you'll understand this word very well. And it's the word obedience. I knew I'd get a mixed crowd. Hallelujah. Because the word obedience has been been used uh, at times for, for the wrong reasons. Um, obey me, don't ask questions. Um, you know, obedience has gotten a bad rap. But I want to talk to us this morning, and, and I'm going to go ahead and give you our title before we get into the word of the Lord, but I, I want to, if you'll be patient with us, I'd like to just slow things down this morning. And, and I want to talk about um, obedience, but not in the way that you think I'm going to preach obedience. Because I know immediately you're like, he's a Pentecostal preacher. He's going to preach on obedience. I should not have brought my neighbor. <laughs> I know that's what you're thinking. Tell your neighbor it's going to be all right. Come on, turn to him and say, you don't got to leave. <laughs> Some of y'all looking for an exit already. And the reason is, is because when we talk about obedience, uh, parents, when we talk about obedience, it's you listen to what I tell you to do, and I don't have to tell you any reason why. And, and so obedience has this, this uh, stigma with it, and, and, and we're afraid to talk about obedience, and we're afraid to discuss obedience. And so um, I want to share with you obedience, but I want to give it to you this way, and I promise you it's going to be good. Tell someone, hold on. I want to give to you the six blessings of obedience. Because, now there's many more than six, but I'm going to narrow it down to six of them. Because if you can get these six key blessings of obedience, you, you'll look at the devil the next time he tells you not to obey God, and you'll laugh in his face, and you'll tell him obedience has blessings. Now listen to me, I'm going to try to do a little teaching, but I'm a preacher. But I'm going to try to tell somebody, don't you listen to the devil that tells you obedience is bondage. Yeah, I'm going to talk to us. Because obedience is not bondage. The world will tell you going to church and being obedient to God, you Christians, you apostolics, you are in bondage. But we're going to find out that there's some blessings that come along with being obedient unto God and unto his word. And I want to help those of you who have been obedient to God to stay the course because something's coming to you. Listen, you can't be obedient to God and his word and nothing happened. I'll say it again. You cannot be obedient unto God and unto his word and God do nothing. There is a blessing that comes to those who say, I will walk this walk of obedience. Somebody say amen. I told myself I ain't going to preach, but I can't help it. <laughs> amen. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles, I got a lot of scriptures to read. Is that okay? 
but if the, the team will run with me, you know, Pentecostal preachers are, are the hardest people for the sound booth and the media team because we all over the place. Amen. We don't often follow a cookie cutter pattern sometimes. Amen. But work with me. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse number one. So I'm going to help those who are struggling with obedience and I'm going to help those who are in obedience and wondering, does this really mean anything? We, we got to stop listening to the world that throws obedience out the window and understand that God rewards those who obey him. Go ahead and say amen. amen. Let me just help you. Every time you say amen, you know what that means? When you say amen to anything Bishop Foster preaches, what you are telling him is what you just said, let it be so also unto me. That's what it means. So when someone says something good, you say amen, you are declaring what he just said, that's going to happen for me. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Are you there at uh, Deuteronomy 11? I got my amen corner over here. How about over here? There we go. Brother Christian, hallelujah. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse number one. One verse I want to read to you to start us off. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge. Somebody say, I got to keep it. And his statutes and his judgments and his, oh, here's that word. Commandments. Somebody go ahead and spit it out. Commandments. And what is that last part? Always. On Sundays only. Always. Only when bishops around. Always. The Bible says always. always. In other words, he says, if you open your eyelids from the time your eyelids open to they close, I want you to consider the, 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 the heaviness of following after my word, following after me, obeying my statutes or my word. He said, I want you to know this. And look how he starts it off. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Now, that wasn't thrown in there to throw you off. He was saying all of this is tied to the fact that if you love me, you're going to follow my word. You're going to follow my statutes, my commandments. Listen, this is a love thing, not a do and a don't. It's not a list of what you can do and what you can't do. It's a love thing. Listen, you're not here this morning because anybody made you be here. Someone says, you Pentecostals have to do this. We don't have to do nothing. My wife doesn't have to live like she does because she has to. She does it out of a love relationship with God. This is a love thing. Somebody say it's a love thing. Amen. Amen. So I want us to talk about six blessings of obedience. Are you ready? Put your Bibles down. Let's pray before we get in this. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. That as we begin to unfold the word of God this morning, that we will leave this place encouraged that as we follow after you, that you would bring such a blessing and anointing and such things to us that we've never had before in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And somebody say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Six blessings of obedience. I, I, when I was in prayer and I was. Uh, talking to the Lord about this, I, I, I did a lot like a lot of folks did. I thought, man, you know, I'm going I'm to leave that for Bishop. I ain't touching obedience. I mean, that's like, that is like 101 evangelism, do not do. Right? I mean, that's like, don't touch it. And, and the Lord said, no, that's, that's the wrong mentality that a lot of folks have. We, we, we often look at obedience as a bad thing. And obedience as bondage and obedience as I have to do that. And, 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 and the enemy's real good about getting us to view obedience that way. That, that true freedom comes living in the world. That true freedom is found doing whatever you want to do in the world and living however you want to live. That's freedom. How many's ever heard that before? That, 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 that just doing your own thing and not being held to any higher power and not, not having to listen to anybody that 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 that's uh that that that's freedom that's true 
true freedom. But the truth really is, is that, that our friends and people that we see, and we're not judging nobody, but let's just be frank, okay? That when we see folks that are living outside of the covenant with God, and they're living outside the word of God, I'm going to tell you what, they ain't free. Thank you, four people. I said, when we look at the world and how they function and how they live and how they walk around, they're, they're scared about everything up and down, up and down. And they're so worried if we get the right person in the White House, we're going to be okay. If we don't get this one, we're going to be, why? Because they're not in freedom. They're in bondage. But the child of God who follows after the word of God and follows after the presence of God, let me just tell you right now, that is a true taste of freedom, my friend. You'll never taste freedom like you can when you're in the house of God, in the presence of God, under the word of God. That's where freedom really is. Hallelujah. So let's jump into this. Number one. And, and, and I'm telling you, as God began to share this with me and the word of God began to open it up, it encouraged me because I've been in Pentecost a long time. Um, we were, I don't know if it was Bishop on, or, or I think it might have been uh, Brother Godwin. Wasn't that a great communion service Wednesday night? <laughs> tremendous, tremendous. And uh, I think it was Brother Godwin who, who uh, said this, but he was talking about those who had the Holy Ghost so many years. I think it was him. And I, in my mind, I was thinking like 10 years. Well, folks, I'm 41 years old, and I got the Holy Ghost when I was six. And I started looking it up, and that's like 36-something years. And all of a sudden, I thought, number one, I thought I'm getting old. Then the second thing I thought is, oh, my gosh, I can join that group of like the 30s. You know, <laughs> how many has had the Holy Ghost 79 years, you know, and I'm moving up that list. And I've been in this a long time, and, 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 uh, and, and I, I, I don't know about you, but, but I, I, I want blessings from God. I, I, want, I want my obedience to God. The things I've done for 41 years or whatever it is, I want to know there's some fruit to that. I don't want to live a frustrated life wondering, is this just redundant? Folks, listen, holiness and, and baptism in Jesus' name and, and, and one God and the word of God, that's not just something a man preaches from this pulpit that you follow that's just a little bit different than someone else. It's, it's obedience to the word of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Number one, obedience attracts the presence of God. Did you get that? Obedience to God and his word attracts the presence of God. That's found in John chapter 14 and verse 23. I hope we got the fast typers up there. John 14 and 23. Listen to this. If a man love me, he will keep my words and the father will love him and we will come unto him and abode with him. Did you get that? He says, if you love me, if you, if you keep my words, or in other words, if you walk in obedience unto me, there's, there's a reward that comes with that. He says, those who obey me, those who, who walk in my word, I'm not just going to stand distant from you, but I'm going to come and we're not just going to show up and just you're going to get a goosebump because there's a lot of folks who can experience the presence of God in a temporary moment on a Sunday morning, but on Monday they don't feel God. And the difference between that and someone who feels God always is obedience. And so if you're saying, well, how do I get more of God in my life? Listen, we're not going to narrow it down to you got to talk in tongues more. Well, if you give more. Well, if you shout more. All those are true, but the real thing is obedience. When we get an obedience unto God, something happens, and his presence shows up. That's why I want to tell you this morning, if you need more of God in your life, you need to get into the word of God and say, God, whatever you require of me, I'm going to obey your word, I'm going to obey your voice, and I'm going to walk in your word. Why? Because that brings God's presence to us. The word abode is the is is the it, it's the Greek word uh, monet, and what that word means is residence. 
I don't know about any of you. Has anybody ever had, maybe I shouldn't say this. I'm going to get in trouble because they may be with you today. <laughs> if they are, please forgive me. Anybody ever had some family show up to visit and they didn't leave? If they're with you, don't point. Don't raise your hand, but how many know what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. They show up. We just come in to visit. Six years later, they're still on the couch. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, nobody. Okay. Well, if you've never had that happen, bless your heart. Praise God. The Bible says that the word abode is monet, meaning that I come to take residence with you. It's different than, watch this, it's dif different than just God coming in and, and touching us. I'm going to help you. See, we have become accustomed to the touch of God, but not the residence of God. And I'm afraid too many of us, we look across the aisle or we look at another church or we look at another group and because they have a, a, a touch of God, we think that what we do in obedience to God's word doesn't matter because look at them. I'm going to preach to you. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I, I come against that spirit that tells us this apostolic way is not the way. It is the way. And there is a blessing to walking in this way. You can say amen. It won't hurt you. And so, and so it, it, it means residence. So I, I, I don't want God just to come and touch me. And I don't want to feel a goosebump on Sunday. But I want to know when I wake up on Monday and I go to my job, is God going to be with me? I, listen, we, we can come in here and the music and the worship and the preaching and the presence of God can be so dynamic. And we can feel God so richly. And then we can go on Monday and wonder, where did God go? God didn't go anywhere. The Bible says you can ascend to heaven, and there he is. Or if you ascend to hell, there he is. What he's saying is, doesn't matter if it's a good time or a bad time. Doesn't matter where you go. God said, I'm going to be there. But the difference is, do you feel a touch of God, or do you feel the residence of God? I don't know about you, but I want God to knock on the door with a suitcase and walk in and say, I've come to stay. I don't want to just feel God on Sunday. I want to feel God on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday. I don't just want to feel him here, but I want to feel him in the hospital room. I, when the doctor walks in there and tells me something's wrong, I want him there. And that comes from Monet. It comes from abode. It comes from God taking residence. And I'm not trying to break your heart or hurt your feelings. But I'm going to tell somebody, if you are not living in obedience to the word of God, don't wake up on Monday and wonder where God is. God didn't go nowhere. It's you, my friend, that's got to find a place in an altar and get into obedience unto God. We'll say, I've been praying and asking God to bless me and with a new car. And we don't give in an offering ever. I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. Listen, I got it before you did. Okay? <laughs> the Lord don't just hand preachers a pamphlet and go just regurgitate this over here and talk about it. No, it first is like bread to me. I chew it and swallow it first. We, listen, I know I'm, I'm taking too long on point one. We got, we got 8,000 points more to go. <laughs> but listen to me. If we, we get frustrated because, because we wonder why God hasn't shown up, and yet we never think about looking into our life to see, is there something I'm disobeying God in? I'm going to tell you something. God will never violate one principle to bless another principle. Never, my friend. You say, I give in the offering and nothing's broke. But then you go out and cuss like a sailor. Doesn't work. Is that okay? 
I'm not talking about do's and don'ts. I'm talking about just getting in the word of God and saying, I'm going to obey this thing. It's, it's, listen, truth is deeper than Bishop Foster. It's deeper than Brother Winslow. It's deeper than your Sunday school teacher. Truth is truth, no matter who preaches it or not. Doesn't change. And God said, I love when my people obey me so much that I'm going to show up in your life. And here's another thing. He started with saying, if you love me, obey me. Can I tell you, don't tell me how much you love God and you won't obey God. He said, they're talking with their mouth, but their heart says something different. You can walk around here and say, well, I love, the, I love God. You can have a bumper sticker that says Acts 238. You can have license plates that says Psalms 119 if you want to. But if you don't obey the voice of God and the word of God, the Bible says you do not love him. Now I'm trying to help us. Don't get mad at me. Because I don't want to just say I love you. And you're like, well, he'll never talk to me. He says he loves me. He'll never say nothing to me. How many know you can tell your wife or your husband I love you so much, but if you don't ever show it every once in a while. Okay, moving on. Hallelujah. That's a mess. (laughs) Right? Show me. And so God compares obedience so powerfully that he compares it to how you love him. Right? So number one is obedience attracts the presence of God. That's why when you get up in the morning and you feel weary because you've just been following what God's been telling you and you're not seeing any results and you feel weary and everybody's bombarding you saying you don't have to live that way, you don't have to talk like that, you don't have to do those things. You hold to the truth of God's word because God's going to show up. And every time he shows up, he brings everything you need with him. Somebody say amen. Amen. Number two, obedience brings identity. Obedience brings identity. It's found in Deuteronomy 28, 9 and 10. It says this, the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways, and watch this, and all the people, somebody say all the people. I'll just bring it down to us. And Dallas, Texas, shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. What did he say? He said, if you will obey, if you'll walk in obedience, uh, obedience, the the reward of that is I will put a I will put a mark on you and you will be my people. I don't know about you, but I want to be counted in that family. I want to know that God looks at me and says, that's mine. We got any mamas in the house? Any mamas in the house? Got any daddies in the house? Any grandparents in the house? Anybody got a kid sitting with four seats next to you anywhere? We're just going to pick anybody. <laughs> I remember the, the, my wife's not in here. I love when she steps out. I'm going to tell a quick story. Hallelujah. I remember the first time I saw my wife in action. It was about our kids. I mean, I'm talking about, anybody heard of Mama Bear? <laughs> you know, you mess with a lot of folks. You, you know, I would rather mess with Chuck Norris than mess with a mother. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Anybody ever seen a mama in action? Oh, Lord. You better back up, Jack. <laughs> and I remember we went to a place to eat, and Gray was just probably about, about two or something like that. And, and we, we, we sat in a restaurant where the tables are like elbow apart from each other. I hate those places. And uh, we're sitting there, and he's in the high chair, and Gray was not. He's a good kid now, but, man, he was not good in restaurants. And, uh, and, and I admit it, he was not a good kid. <laughs> he was horrible in restaurants. And uh, I don't know why we went. And, uh, and, and this table next to us, we could hear them starting to talk about him. Some of y'all went, oh, because y'all know what's coming. Now, we are really peaceable people, me and my wife. We are, you can almost run my cat over. I don't have a cat, so I can pick on my cat. You can run, Sister Foster, I'm sorry. My dog. 
I got to plan this out better, Sister Foster, before I start using stories. And uh, uh, we're peaceable, but I could hear them. I mean, we're like, we're like four feet apart from them. And we can hear them talking about him. And they're saying things like, if that was my kid, mm-hmm, I'd be doing something. I'd, be, I'd tell you what I'd do. And they're talking, and I'm like, we're right here. Like, can you wait till you get to the van? You know what I'm talking about. And I'm just getting upset. And my wife sees me. We've only been married about five years, four years, something like that. And, 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 and so, um, so I, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm starting to get upset. I'm like, I'm about, to, I'm about to say something. Holy Ghost, can you go to the restroom? <laughs> Take a break. How I many know what I'm talking about? Oh, y'all so religious. I said, Holy Ghost, you're going to have to plug your ears. Because I'm about to say something. <laughs> And April looks at me and she says, baby, don't you say nothing. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to say something. I'm, this, I'm not eating the whole time. They're talking about my firstborn, you know. <laughs> Getting worked up. <laughs> you know, and she says, you're not going to say nothing. And I said, all right, I'm not going to say nothing. They said one more thing. And she turned. Never before, never since has she ever done this. And she turns and she looks and she says, excuse me. I can hear every word you're saying. Do you have a problem? And I went. And the husband apologized for his wife and all that. We get outside and I had two things to say to her. I said, first of all, how dare you not give me my moment? God, honest truth. I was mad. I said, how dare you? You told me not to say nothing and then you say something. She goes, I couldn't help it. And then the second thing I said was, I have never been more in love with you than I am right now. (laughs) Woo! I don't know why I told y'all that. He's... (laughs) But when God establishes us, he's like, he's like the daddy that when he hears the devil talk about you, you're not just some random person floating out there. You are a child of God, and God takes it personal. Are you hearing me? God takes it personal when the devil attacks you, and he comes against your family. And he co- Why? Because I have been identified as one of his, and now whenever the devil shows up, God says, I don't think so. That's That's my child. That's my son. That's my kid. You better shut your mouth. Get your, ah, somebody better hear me. There is a reward of obedience, and that reward is identity, and identity means God will fight for you. That's why the Bible says that he already knows the thoughts and things you ask before you even speak them, because he's your daddy. So it brings identity. That's why when I go through things, I always say, God, I am your son. I am your child. I can't do this without you. And God says, I got you. Right? I got you. There's nothing I wouldn't do for my children. And if you're a parent or a grandparent or a guardian or you know how it is, right? There's nothing you wouldn't do. Go 12 years without buying a new shirt. Non-parents did not get that at all. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Obedience brings identity. I got to hurry. Is this okay so far? Number three, obedience brings blessings. I know y'all were waiting for that one. Obedience brings blessings. Now, we know that one, right? We, we know that if we obey, and, but a lot of times we kind of single down to, to giving, shouting, you know, We we kind of pinpoint it to three or four things. But the Bible says that obedience, any obedience to the word of God, brings a blessing to us. It's found in Deuteronomy uh, 28, 1, 2, and 12. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all. Somebody say just a few. Uh, Some of y'all good. Somebody say just a few. Oh, there's a good few over here. Just a few. There we go. Oh! Somebody say, don't do that to me. I've been out of school 20 years. 
He said all his commandments. That means, you know what, you can't just get one and say, this is the one I'm going to carry, and God's going to do everything I need off of this one thing right here. It don't work that way. He says, if you want to know the richness of my glory, if you want to know the richness of my power, if you really want me to show up in the midst of everything you're going through, and for me to walk in there and change and renew and restore, then he said, I want you to open my word, and I want you to look at it, and I want I want you to say, God, whatever you tell me, I'm going to follow that. When you do that, God said, there's nothing that won't come your way. Blessings will overtake you, the Bible says. Somebody say, I want blessings. Somebody say, I need a blessing this morning. Watch this. He said, all commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Somebody say, privilege. I should have made that a seventh one. Hallelujah. Privilege. He said, I'm going to bless you so much, you're going to be more blessed than anybody on earth. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Amen. And all these blessings shall come upon you, and I love this part, and overtake you. Why? Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. I don't know about you, but if I need things in my life, I don't care what my neighbor thinks, I'm going to start listening for that voice. And when God, if God speaks to me and says, I want you to get out and I want you to run these aisles, guess what I'm going to do? See, we take it lightly. Listen to me. We take it lightly because God, God pushes us and we feel this unction to worship and to shout and run aisles or whatever it is. And we don't do it. And we think we just didn't, we just didn't contribute to the service. We think, well, I didn't shout. Someone else did. I'll shout next Sunday. Or I'll do this or I'll give next time. Or all this. And we don't realize there's deeper roots. You... Listen, you don't shout because Brother Foster wants you to shout. You don't shout because I want you to shout. I can't bless you for running the aisles. I got about $10 in my pocket. That's about as far as my blessing is going to go for you, which is about a tank, a half a tank of gas now. Well, that probably ain't that much now, right? So that's why when God, I, we were in revival, uh, I don't know what service it was, but I was over here. And, and in California, where I'm from, y'all forgive me, in California, where I'm from, uh, <laughs> The young people growing up, we, we, we take our jacket off, and we twirl our jackets. I know y'all like, that's crazy. Well, hey, that's what we do. <laughs> and we would, we would twirl our jackets, and that's what we, West Coast, that's how we worshiped in the youth group. And we take that jacket off, and we whirl that thing, and buddy, if you weren't in the spirit, you're going to get knocked in the spirit. Hallelujah. And we twirl that thing, and guess what, God? I'm 41 years old, folks. I'm halfway home. That's 82. No, I'm not. Hallelujah. I want to live to 100. But I was standing over there, and this is what God said. Take your jacket off and twirl it like you did when you were 16. And I said, excuse me? (laughs) I don't know if anybody ever remembers that service of me twirling a jacket over here. Um, Almost took five people out. I'm sorry. And God said, I want you to twirl that thing like you did when you were 16. I said, I am 41 years old, dignified, got a family and a job. No, I'm not. These folk going to think I'm crazy. But listen, obedience is deeper than just that moment. For all I know, God was about to bless my family, and it was tied to that single moment of obedience. I'm going to help you right here. You think shouting and clapping your hands is foolish, and you don't even understand that one simple act of obedience could have a long, direct line to one year from now, God's going to remember you worshiping in a Sunday morning, and he's going to say, because of your obedience, I will remove cancer from your body. You think I'm crazy, but I'm telling you, obedience has rewards. That's why who, oh, come on, somebody. Who cares who's sitting next to you? If God tells you to do something, why don't you obey what God is telling you and see what God does? (laughs) 
So I took that jacket off and I began to wave that jacket around like an idiot and began to twirl it. Why? Because if God tells me to do it, I'm just going to do it and I'm going to obey God and watch God bless me. Don't you listen to no knucklehead sitting next to you telling you, oh, we don't need to clap our hands. Go ahead. Live like you live. But watch me get a blessing when I get out of my normal and obey the voice of God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Say hallelujah. 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 Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. You say, but I don't know when the moment is to shout. Shout and we'll figure it out. You got the best pastor the world has ever seen. If you get out of order, he'll kindly tell you, hey, wait, right here, do this. He'll just get out and shout and let God do the rest. I don't care what moment in a service is. You ought to, if God says, get up, clap your hands, do it. If God says, run the aisles, do it. If God says, walk up here, twirl around three times, go sit down, do it. We got to get back to obeying the voice of God in the service and doing whatever God tells us to do. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Clap your hands under God right now. I feel the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Turn to somebody and say, God's going to do something. Hallelujah. Obedience brings blessings. Why don't you shout out, I need a blessing. Hallelujah. Verse number 12 says this, and to bless all the work of thine hands. Blessings. Somebody say blessings. I've got to hurry. Is it 12, 13 or 11, 13? Someone said it's 11, 13. All right. Number four, obedience works for everyone. Obedience isn't just for the people called to preach. Well, he's a preacher. That's why. Obedience isn't just for Brother Foster. Obedience isn't just for the staff, the leader, Sunday school teacher. Are you getting it? Obedience is for everyone. Everyone. Watch this. Tell someone it's for you. Hebrews 11 and 8. I'm sorry. Psalms 128 and 1 says... Blessed is everyone. Say everyone. Everyone. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. Watch this. That walketh in his ways. It didn't say blessed are those that are at DFC only. Blessed are the Winslow family only. It said blessed is everyone. What it means is it doesn't matter if, if you are in church one week so far or you've been in this thing for a hundred years or you, have, you were baptized last week or you were baptized in 1983. doesn't matter if your last name is Winslow or Foster or Johnson or Tovar or, 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 or uh, Castillo or, or, or whoever it is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, obedience works for everyone. That means when I wake up, God says what? And you say, Say, God, I want to follow after your ways. And God says, okay, now watch me do something in your life. Pedigree doesn't matter. How long you've been in it. It's not like, well, when I'm obeying God for 40 years, like Brother Winslow, God's really going to show up. No. He said obedience is for everyone. Someone say amen. Number five. Obedience doesn't require understanding. 
I could preach an hour right there, but I won't. Someone say, thank God. Obedience does not require understanding. That gets us right there, doesn't it? Gets me. I don't know about you, but, but I want to know the next step. When God says, I'm going to heal you, you say, okay, what time? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm waiting. Any moment. Any moment. We want a time. We want a location. Who's going to lay hands on me? And you already start picking out three people that are going to lay hands on you. And God ain't said nothing yet. And you already zeroed in on Sister Tovar, Brother Tovar. You know, you're zeroed in on, you know what I'm saying? You're, you zeroed in on six people going, I got you. How many you know what I'm talking about? You're guilty. I'm guilty. Well, all right. Sister Tovar left. It ain't today. Sorry, Sister Tovar. I only pick on those I love. It's true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My wife used to say, your dad is so mean. And I would say, what do you mean? She, he picks on me all the time. And I said, baby, the day my dad does not pick on you, that means he don't like you. <laughs> it's a sign of affection. Just roll with it. But you know how it is, right? We, 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 want, it, we want it planned out. Right? Because nobody, right? Because you got you to gotta, you gotta plan out your life's insurance. You know, you got to plan out how your burial is going to go. You know, the world teaches be planned and prepared. And don't, how much is in your savings account, uh, Brother Ramsey? Some of y'all got that. Snowball effect or whatever it's called. Hallelujah. And, and we plan, don't we? And there's nothing wrong with planning, okay? But, but the problem with, with our life is, is, is we think, because we don't have the full picture, we can't obey. I'm trying to close as quickly as I can, but I'm, I'm trying to get to somebody. We think because God hasn't spelled it all out, and I'm preaching to myself right now. Because it ain't all spelled out and dotted and T's crossed. And we're not going to obey until God says it. But Peter moved off the boat onto water on one word. Jesus never said, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to solidify that water. I'm going to change the properties of it to concrete. And when you step out, the wind's not going to touch you. The waves, you're not going to get wet. Your feet are going to feel like you're walking on soft ground. You just, no, he didn't, did he? He just said, come. And Peter said, that's all I need. I don't know how this is going to work out, but that's all I needed. Obedience does not require understanding. I'm going to help you. Found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Did you get that? Young people, I hope you get this one. Because you will become frustrated if you don't know, well, I don't know how God's going to use me, and I don't know how this is going to work out. And I don't, listen, obedience doesn't... Re Abraham said, what, Lord? And God said, I want you to gather your family, and I want you to go to the place I will send you. And Abraham didn't sit there and go, okay, just tell me the city, how many miles, I'll fill up the tank of gas, we'll, we'll get some snacks in there, we'll, you know, we'll load up and we'll go. No, no, he went out, the Bible says he went whether he didn't even know. He just simply said, here we go. And the whole time, you know what he was doing? In other words, this is what he was saying. I'm going to walk until you tell me to turn left. And if you don't say left, I'll keep walking. He didn't know where he was going. You don't have to have it spelled out to obey God. But I will tell you this. When you step out in faith and you obey God, the plan begins to unfold itself. Somebody say amen. Go ahead and stand. I'm closing. Number six. Obedience rarely looks like our plan. You see, there's some of us that are here today, and you know exactly what God has asked you to do. You know exactly what God has asked you to come out of. You know exactly what God has, has, has spoken to you, and you have failed to this moment to obey. You don't need a preacher to get up and, and try to tell you what God told you. Most of you know what he told you. You don't need Brother Winslow to walk up to you and say, The Lord gave me a dream of you, and you were doing this. You don't need that. 
Most of us know exactly what God has told us to do and not to do. Whether directly from his word or his spirit speaking to us or his voice, we know the steps of obedience. If I was to sit down with each of you and say, what has God asked you to do that you have not done? I guarantee you there'd be none of us, if we were honest, none of us would say, he hasn't said anything. And watch this. And there'd be none of us that could say, I'm doing everything he says. So don't act holy. Even myself, there's things God has challenged me that I am struggling to step into because I think it, oh, too big. Too much. All of us in here, whether this is the first time you're here, and if you're a visitor, I hope you get something out of this. But no matter who you are, all of us have something that if we would be honest with ourselves, not confessing to me, but just honest within yourself, you know God's speaking things to you. It could be simple as God saying, how come you're not praying anymore? Where you been? I want you to pray. Some, some of you, you pray and, and you're so proud of your, your hour, the golden number, right? Hour. And God has been challenging you to pray more than an hour. But you're so satisfied that I do an hour, nobody else does. That's disobedience. See, see yesterday's obedience can become tomorrow's disobedience. Well, God told me in 1973 that I was to do this, this, and that. And God's been telling you something different, and you keep holding on to that. Listen, what God has said before, if that's not what God's saying today, it's disobedience. It's why every day you ought to wake up and say, God, am I following after you? Am I following your voice? Am I doing the things God wants me to do? There are things that if I told you that I don't do, you would think they're stupid. But God has told this guy right here, don't do it. And I obey. I don't sit there and say, well, Sister Foster doesn't. Brother Foster doesn't. My wife doesn't. Or my neighbor doesn't. When God speaks to me, my, watch me. The obedience God speaks to me becomes my requirement to obey. Not my wife's. You can't live for God through your pastor. You can't live through God through Brother Winslow, your wife, your spouse, your mother. Your obedience is yours to obey and yours alone. There's a very, and I'm closing with this, there's a very indicting passage in the New Testament that gives a picture of those who are standing before Jesus. And he says some very profound things. And the reason he answers this has to be because of what they said to him. And I'll tell you what they said to him, and you'll catch on where I'm going. Jesus... I laid hands on someone and they were healed. I prayed for someone and cancer left them. I went out and I fed, I fed the poor. I went out and I, I, I went through my neighborhood and helped everyone that was in need. And the reason we know they said that to him is because of his response. His response was this. I know that you have cast out devils in my name, you've healed the sick, you've done mighty miracles, you've done great works. He said, but I do not know you. Depart from me. Let me help you with that. Don't attack miracles. It's not miracles. Don't attack doing good to people. It's not that. Those are all requirements in the word of God to do. But the problem was that they had singled it down to three or four things they would obey the word of God in. And they said, we found the verse that says, lay hands on the sick. I think it's in James. That says, lay hands on the sick in my name and, and they shall be healed. And they took that obedience and said, we're going to lay hands on the sick. And they found the, the verse that says, and those that give to the poor shall not lack. And said, we're going to obey that verse. In other words, they had pick and choose things out of God's word to obey and had neglected the rest. And so here he is looking at them and he's saying, I know, I know. I, I, I saw you when you laid hands on that one and they were healed. I saw it. I, I know, I saw you go down the street and you knocked on doors and you gave groceries to people and you clothed the poor and the homeless. And I know that you were good and I know you did all these works and all these things. 
I know that. But I don't know you. And this ties us back to the first one. Why did he know him? Because he did not monet. He did not abode with them. He was saying, you, you, you didn't follow all my ways. Church, visitors, listen to me. All of us can point out things we're really good at. All of us can. Jesus said to the man that asked him, what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to have the blessings and the goodness? And Jesus said these words to him. One thing, because he named everything, didn't he? He said, I've done all those Ten Commandments. I've done all these things. Jesus said these words, if you really want me, if you really want me, go and sell all that you have. And give it away. The Bible says he left bitter. You can obey God 90% of the way, but be disobedient in one thing, and the whole thing crumbles. We're not talking about struggles, okay, folks? I'm not talking about you struggling through, battling through. We're not talking about perfection, okay? Brother Winslow, I can't be perfect. We're not talking about perfection. We're talking about getting in a place where we say, God, your voice means everything to me. Everything to me. I want us to open these altars, and here's what I'm asking us to do today. doesn't matter if you're a visitor. doesn't matter if, if you're new to Pentecost or this church. We want to invite you to come as well. And what I'm asking you to do is I want you to come to this altar and I want you to get back to a place where you get real with God and you begin to tell God, God, I know what you're asking me to do. I know what you're saying. I, I know these are the things you're asking me to come out from. I know these are the things that you're saying, don't do that anymore. Don't go there anymore. Or, or pick this up. Start doing this. Or, and you know what it is. I want you to come to this altar and I want you to give that back to God and say, God, if you will give me the strength, the courage, and the faith to do it, I want to start walking in your ways I want to start obeying your word and some of us today that could simply be this that we've never repented in all of our lives maybe you're here and you have never come to an altar and you have never asked God to forgive you of what you've done the Bible says we are all born into iniquity we are all sinners and the only answer to that is repentance. So maybe you're not up here saying, I'm going to pick up prayer. But maybe for you, it's simply, I need to get right with God. I need, I need God to know today that i got to get right with Him. It's not about getting right with Brother Winslow or your name. Tonight, today is i got to get right with God. And some of you, you've never been baptized in Jesus' name. The Bible says in Acts 2.38, Repent of your sins, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Some of you have been battling whether you should or not. Today's the day to obey the Word of God and be baptized in that wonderful name. Maybe some of you have never been filled with the Holy Ghost. You've heard people talk in tongues and you've seen and you've read and you've, you, you've felt God's presence, but you've never, you've never tasted of His Spirit living within you, the Holy Ghost. Today's a good day to obey His voice and step out and say, I'm in need of the Holy Ghost. Some of you, it's, it's deeper because there's some sin in your life. There's some junk in your life. There's a mess in your life. Listen, don't come up here and patty cake because I don't know what you're going through, but He does. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this has greatly blessed you. If you'd like to contact us for more information or for a Bible study, please visit us at dallasfirstchurch.com. We especially want to thank those of you who support this ministry financially. It's because of you that we're able to continue to spread the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. If you would like to give right now, you can do so by clicking on the link in the description or by going to dallasfirstchurch.com slash give. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss a Sunday service. God bless you.